Let's see how we can manipulate quantum states and therefore manipulate quantum information as well. We're going to do this with unitary operations. So one thing that you have to realize is that all information is physical. This is because the information is represented by physical systems. Therefore, to change the information and process it, we have to interact with the physical systems that carry the information. For example, in classical information, you've got two very good examples in uh, HDDs, where you read, write and manipulate information with uh, very weak and precise magnetic fields. And for an example of a, a younger technology, we can look at the solid state drive, where you do the same thing, but you achieve it by manipulating very weak electric currents. On the other hand, in quantum information, you can look at physical systems such as ion traps. For example, uh, this ion trap from a company called IonQ, where individual atoms represented by these blue dots, they're suspended on magnetic fields and they represent uh, individual quantum bits. And you apply some uh, pulses of lasers uh, and you can manipulate the states of these uh, uh, qubits. On the other hand, you can also look at the superconducting uh, uh, qubits from uh, companies such as IBM or Google, where you can do the same thing. So, but how do we actually describe these transformations? Before we do that, let's look at some examples. The most simple transformation that we can think of is actually to do nothing. And we call this the identity operation, and it's usually represented by uh, a capital I. So what that does when it's affecting, uh, acting on a, a cat, it takes cat 0 to 0 and cat 1 to 1. And classically, we can also do something similar by just not touching our classical bit. 0 remains 0 and 1 remains 1. Uh, another very simple operation is the flip. Uh, usually we call it either a flip or a Pauli X operation and we represent it by a capital X. And it does exactly what you would expect. It takes the input uh, cat0 into an output cat1 and vice versa cat1 into a cat0. Again, classically, you have a corresponding representation as well. It's the NOT gate where it takes input 0 into classical bit 1 and bit 1 into classical bit 0. Also, we can create superpositions. This is known as the Hadamard operation, uh, denoted by capital H. It takes as input the cat zero, and it outputs an equal superposition of zero or one. Or it can take in the input as one, and output zero minus one. And now you see, this is the first example of a quantum operation that doesn't really have a classical analog. As we said, we cannot have um, uh, superpositions of classical bits. So, what's the definition of a unitary operation? All of these examples that we consider, they are examples of unitary operations. Any unitary operation has the property of being reversible. That means we can undo it. We can reverse its effect. And this is done by this, uh, what's known as an adjoint, denoted as U dagger, where U is the unitary. So, let's see how that works. We start with a cat psi, and we apply a unitary that transforms it into a completely new uh, cat psi prime. And then if we apply the adjoint, so the operation which undoes the effect of the original unitary, we end up back again at the state uh, cat psi. So we can write uh, cat psi prime is equal to the unitary u applied to the cat psi. Or we can also write cat psi is equal to the adjoint of the unitary, unitary applied to cat psi prime. So let's put these two together. We start with our input state psi. We apply uh, the, ad, which is the same as applying the adjoint to the state psi prime. But then again, we know the expression for psi prime from over here, so we can just substitute it in and we get u dagger times u times the state psi and that's it. You see that in order for these sides to be equal, we must conclude that u dagger times u is the identity operator. And that makes logical sense. We are undoing the operation u with the adjoint, so the total effect of these two is we are doing nothing. Similarly, we can do it for psi prime, which is equal to u applied to psi, and again we substitute for psi this expression over here, and we get a similar expression as above, u times u uh, dagger times the state psi prime. 
So from that, we can see that also what needs to be true is that u times u dagger is equal to the identity operator. And that's precisely the definition of unitary operations. There you go. That u times u dagger must be equal to u dagger times u, and that is equal to the identity. Let's move on. How can we represent this in, uh, in matrix representation? So, so far we have been talking about states as these cats, but in fact they can be represented as vectors. And we know that in order to transform vectors, we have to multiply them by matrices. Therefore, unitary operations can be represented by matrices. So let's look at some examples. First, let's begin with states. Usually we denote uh, cat zero in vector notation like this. It's a column vector one and zero. The cat one, on the other hand, is a column vector of zero, one. So that, then you can see that any general state psi can be represented as alpha times the vector one, zero plus beta times zero, one. Or in other words, it can just be represented as a complex ve column vector alpha, beta. So now let's look at examples of some uh, uh, matrices and unitary operations. The identity operator is represented by this matrix right here. It's just a diagonal, ma diagonal matrix. It's got ones on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Pauli operators. We have encountered one Pauli operator already, the X operator, which flips our cat from zero to one and from one to zero. But there are two other very important Pauli operators, the Y and the Z. And they have these matrix representations. And also for completeness, we also have the Hadamard operator that creates a superposition. So let's see some examples just to give you a little bit of feeling how this can actually work in practice. For the flip operation, you take the Pauli X, you apply it or multiply by uh, cat zero. So you have this matrix zero, one, one, zero multiplying our cat zero, which is represented in the column vector one, zero. So we see that zero times one, zero, plus one times zero is zero. So we get a zero here in this first element of this new column vector. But then we have one times one plus zero times zero, which is one. And you see that this is actually our uh, cat one. So it indeed did flip a zero into one as we would expect. And you can do the same thing for one. Again, you multiply the uh, matrix representation of the Pauli X operator with the column vector representation of state one, and you get, uh, as expected, cat zero. To see how you can create a superposition, you just take the Hadamard operator, you apply it to zero, you go through the algebra, and in the end, what you get is an equal superposition of zero and one. Please notice that this uh, factor in the Hadamard operator, one over square root, ensures that the uh, superposition vector at the end is properly normalized. As we said, if we take this number in front of zero and it's also in front of one, and we take the mod squared of both and we add them, it has to be one. Half plus a half is equal to one. Therefore, this vector is correctly normalized. And you can do the same thing for one. And again, as we have seen in the previous step, you get zero minus one. Again, an equal superposition. Now, we mentioned this adjoint. So far, it's, it's been a rather abstract notion that can undo the effect of a unitary operation. How can we actually systematically compute uh, this adjoint given a unitary matrix? It's actually very simple. There are two steps to it. You take the complex conjugate of the matrix. Just to remind you, the complex conjugate of a complex number, x plus i, y, uh, star, which is the notation for complex conjugation, is equal to x minus i, y. So wherever you see uh, i, you just flip its sign, and that's your complex conjugate. So that's step number one. First, take the complex conjugate of the matrix, and then take the transpose. The transpose of the matrix is given as follows. So for any uh, uh, matrix u, which has elements u0, 0, 0, u0, 1, u1, 0, and u1, 1, 1 uh, transposing them will exchange the off-diagonal elements. So let's see how this unitary u actually uh, turns into an adjoint. First, we apply the complex conjugation. So we take each element and we write this little star there, denoting that this element is complex conjugated. And then we apply the transpose. So you see that I have flipped these off diagonal elements, but I have not touched the diagonal elements. And that's your uh, U dagger, your adjoint operation. In particular, if you look at an example given by unitary uh, Pauli Y matrix, written as this. First, 
we take the complex conjugate. So we zero is just zero, but uh, the signs in front of these off-diagonal elements change because they're pure imaginary. And then we flip them because we are applying the um, transpose and we get the same vector, uh, sorry, same matrix Y. When this happens, when the adjoint of a unitary matrix is equal to the unitary matrix, we say that that matrix is self-adjoint. And we will see many examples where this is in fact true. Now, another very important class of uh, unitary operations are rotations. And this is where the you know, block sphere representation will be extremely handy. So, the rotation can be written in this uh, a strange looking form, for, strange for now. And what it means is that we are rotating around some arbitrary uh, direction in the block sphere by some arbitrary angle theta. And we write this as this following uh, exponent. So here uh, n hat is just some unitary ve vector given by coordinates nx, ny, and z. And this vector given by sigma hat is just uh, a vector of our Pauli matrices x, y, and z. So we can write this as follows. This exponent, uh, this exponential, decomposes into cosine theta over 2 times the identity matrix minus i times sine theta 2, and then this expression, which is just the dot product between these two vectors. So we multiply nx by Pauli matrix x plus ny times Pauli matrix Y plus NZ times uh, Pauli matrix Z. It does look a little bit complicated, but in the block sphere representation, it becomes very, very clear what's going on. Let's consider an example. We want to rotate around the Y axis, given by this horizontal axis here, through an angle of pi over two, and our initial state is given by zero. So let's start at the point zero and we just rotate around the y-axis, so we are going down on the surface by angle pi over 2. And you see that we reach the state psi, uh, sorry, state plus, which is equal superposition of 0 and 1. More generally, you don't have to rotate about any of these orthogonal axes, you can rotate about any uh, axis uh, that you want, and then you are rotating in this plane given by this uh, uh, parameterized by this angle theta. So it takes some uh, initial state psi that's on the surface of the block sphere, it follows um, uh, the surface and it ends in some new state psi uh, prime. So you can see you can work in the matrix representation and uh, or you can work also in the block sphere representation.